So what we're doing is that we have an exam on Friday. Your exam is going to be set to Friday. You have a study guide already. That's what you were supposed to be doing over the break, along with your chapter work. What chapter is this? Eight. Chapter 8. And you have a study guide. That should have been turned in already, right? If it hasn't been, you better turn it in. Because I'm gonna, you know what I'm gonna have to do for this test? I'm gonna have to shut down allowing you to turn it in. Because I allowing you to turn it in. Because some of you are waiting till the day after the test to turn, to do the study guide, and I just think that's ridiculous. So I'm gonna have to start just not allowing you to turn in if you can't get the study guide done before before the test. It's, it was due today, but just turn in. Turn it in. You had an entire, I told you, you had almost a week. It, there's no excuse. So a study guide. And what's the study guide on? It's on energy. It's on photosynthesis. And respiration. So the respiration photosynthesis. That's what you're dealing with. And that's in a, it, that exam is going to be on, on Friday. You have a final coming up. The final is on the week of December 17th. Ms. Simpson has gone over this with you, yes? In detail. If not, you better catch up. She has, with everyone who's been in class. Oh, yeah, we're Yeah, yeah. So fi the final uh, is going to be on the week of the 17th. I don't know what day is your, your assignment is. I know it's, they handed me out a calendar. I don't know exactly when. It is comprehensive. That means anything we've covered up to the week of the final can be on that test. Is that clear? There's going to be two versions. I'm not sure which one you're going to get. It's either going to be 80 multiple choice questions or it's going to be 40 question, uh, multiple choice questions and several extended responses. But you will have a full two-hour exam. It is a two-hour exam. No break. Unless you have to go to the restroom. If you go to the restroom, you have to leave your phone here. That's it. It's two hours straight. That's your exam in this class. I don't know how else to explain that other than what I've already said. It's a two-hour exam, no breaks other than going to the restroom. You may go to the restroom if you have to. You leave your phone here. That's it. Yeah. Um, are you splitting the test version up like throughout the room, or are we all getting I haven't decided how I'm going to do that yet. Yeah. Um, is it double-weighted or something? like? Oh, it'll be a big part of your grade, yeah. It's going to be a big, big, big part of your grade. It's massive. Look, I, I've said this a hundred times, I'll say it again, college, that's how it is, right? They usually have four tests in college, on most classes. Four tests. That's it. With your final being the heaviest, sleep, the, the heaviest weight. All semester long, you have four tests. There's no homework, no projects, no labs. If you're taking a biology class, you have a lab, which is its own class, and then you have your class. They give you homework. You just don't get any points for it. You don't got to do it, but good luck passing the test if you don't. And that's the lesson that we're trying to teach you that so many of you want to resist. No, this is just wasting time. So, so 
the twenty uh, two hour exam chapter uh, chap uh, the hour the exam this week is obviously not the final, but your final is in two weeks. Actually, three weeks. One, two, three. Actually, four weeks if you include this week. But if you have it on Monday, if your exam's on Monday, you have one. Including this week is one, two, three, on the fourth week. So you have three weeks to get ready. Three weeks before your final. Three weeks. Your study guide is coming on Wednesday. I'm not answering any questions right now. I really, I really don't need this right now. Thank you. Your study guide's on Wednesday. So you'll have something to look at as you move forward. You're going to, also you're going to get an activity that I gave my, my several readings on how to run a study group. I think it's essential that everyone in this room be in some type of study group. I don't care if you're not in my advisory. I don't care who you're in a study group with. You have a big sister or big brother in, in college who's taking biology, fine. You have, if you keep talking, there's going to be issues. Bless you. I don't care how you handle your, your business, but I encourage strongly a study group session. In fact, there's going to be some homework, some project points that are going to be available for study group work. And I'm going to give you a homework assignment tomorrow, not today, because i got other things to go over today. But it's how to run a study group, how to be an active, how to do some active learning. The stuff that's in the six R's that we've been trying to get into your head all semester with mix, a mixture of success. Having a study group is a big, big deal. Being able to work in a study group is directly correlated to being successful at the professional level. Law school, medical school, a lot of that, those people that are the most successful at that level are people that work well in a study group. You have 100 pages to read, it becomes much easier to go through it when you take sit 10 people and divide it, it tends to be, but just for numerical uh, sense, let's say five people and divide 20 pages each, and then you teach each other, you quiz each other, you, you share resources with one another. And that is how you get through life, let alone a professional professional level work. So anyways, there'll be some assignments on a project. So if you have a study group, uh, study group assignment, my, my uh, advisory class already got this assignment. Some of you in my, are in my advisory class, right? So some of you already have it. And it'll be a series of assignments that I expect you to be doing in your study group. But of course, for biology, I expect you to do it for biology. If you do it for other classes, great. A great study group can get you A's in all your classes that you share together and make your life a lot easier. But that's on you. A bad study group, though, I'm going to warn you right now, is going to bring you down. People that are not going to, if you have 100 pages to read, and you're supposed to read 20 pages each, every person that doesn't read anything, that means more work for everybody else. And then it becomes unmanageable. And there's frustration and anger. If you're not going to participate, say you're not going to participate early on. Don't have people depend on you, and then you not do that work. That's not right. So that's your final. We'll be working on study groups and, and developing that as we move forward. And tomorrow, tomorrow you're going to get uh, an assignment, reading assignment, uh, to be done by... by Wednesday and then you'll get another assignment another assignment etc 
one of the things, I'm going to give you a study guide on Wednesday, but I'm going to have you create your own study guide as well. And your study guide will be a lot more involved. All right. So that's your final. That's your test this week. Um, let's move on then. Uh, you know you have your cellular respiration photosynthesis study guide should be done at this point. The purpose of the chapter, the chapter reading, was all about the flow of energy in a biosphere and living things. Is how, does, how do living things process energy? What is energy and how do they, how do they process it? As you know, this is a, as you can see, those of you that have it, I think every, everybody has this in their Jupiter and electronic form. I will be printing enough for everyone. I think I need probably something like 18 more in this class. And then I'll have two classes after this. So I'm going to go and photocopy. I should have already copied all of them, but obviously something happened to them. As is normal, I think, in this place. So, when we're looking at... Uh, Carbon dioxide, obviously it's a big deal. It's one of the big molecules, and it's one of those big ideas, carbon dioxide, and how, what it does in the atmosphere, what it does, where is it made, how is it used, that kind of thing. You should obviously get to know that. You should understand, at this point, you should already know how are water molecules used, that water molecules are a waste product from cellular respiration, that it's used by photosynthesis, what are carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids and, and nucleic acids. These are things that, that you should know by now. What's oxygen and how is it used? Uh, how plants conduct photosynthesis, you should know by now. How the light reactions, how is light changed into energy? Um, those kinds of things. Those are things that I would expect at this point you know. If, this, if, it, if you're sitting there going, I don't know that, then it should be, I guess I better get to moving on that. We've gone over it in class. Then, when we look at, and, and you should read this, obviously, as you do it, because it's not just coloring. It's a, it is a coloring book, but it's, it's more than that. It's a good review. And it really does talk about how animals excrete water, Right? What does excrete mean? They put water out. Right? They produce carbon dioxide and water. The water they, they, they excrete it. They urinate it out. Or they sweat it. And, in, and the carbon dioxide they release into the atmosphere. Right? Animals exhale. And, and some water may be excreted in liquid. Or is a semi-solid form? What's a semi-solid form? Poop, right? Plants carry on this oxidation. So when we add oxygen, we're talking about adding oxygen, right? That's what oxidation means, adding, adding electrons, depending on how you look at it. And then finally, there's so this is all broken down into sections, and then you're going to sit there, and you're going to, look at it, and you're going to color code it, so you're going to say, well, the sun is A, and I, I would like it if it's neat, and so that it shows that you put some effort into it, so you say sun is yellow, and maybe light energy is yellow. So any color you want? Any color you want, just make it look nice, try to color in the lines, if you don't color in lines, let it be artistic. And so you have A and B are going to be yellow. And I come over here, there's A. There's A. And, and I'm not going to do it really nicely because I don't have time. But there's 
there's A, and then of course, uh, and then I think A and B, right? So there's B. So A and B are yellow. Now the question is, what is C or what's K? K is what? Find K in the in the key. And it's heat energy gains. Let me use red for heat energy. This is me. You can use whatever color you want. I don't, it just makes sense to me to use red for heat. I'm not going to color the whole thing because we don't have a lot of time. But then I would go over here and I would just do. I would just do K. So that so I would do that, and I, I'd be a little neater than I am being here. So you do A, 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 B, K so far, and you could go ahead and color code it and make it look nice. And now let's take a look at what this means. It, remember, K is also this, isn't it? Heat's lost here as well, or gained. This is K, K1, KI, which is heat energy lost. And maybe you choose a different color for heat energy lost, right? Maybe maybe red is heat energy lost. I don't know. You can come up with your own system. You get the idea, yes? So there's there's stuff like that. And of course, don't do that messy, but there it is. So you're going to do that, and hopefully you understand that this is where the energy is going in a system. This is an ecosystem, right? This is not a cell. A cell is a system, but so is an ecosystem, an ecology, ecological system. Here's this plant. If you take a look, a close look at it, that's all the, all the arrows are energy, but you can take a look. That here's molecules here as well. There's a molecule of oxygen. Where is oxygen coming from? It's coming from the plant because it's released from the processing of water, the breakdown of water, where the photosynthesi photosynthetic reactions, the light reactions, got the electrons and released oxygen. Remember that? Yeah. Here's carbon dioxide going in. Where is it going into? Why is the plant taking carbon dioxide in? Say again. No, carbon dioxide is not used to produce oxygen. What's carb uh, Oxygen is produced by the plant by the breakdown of water. That is a question I will ask repeatedly, so I would get to know that answer well. The oxygen in photosynthesis is produced by the breakdown of water in the first photosystem, photosystem 2. Can you say that one more time? No, it's recorded. You can review it when it's posted. Are we, are we clear? If you're not clear, you haven't gone over photosy photos uh, photosynthesis. It's a, it's a pretty clear chart in the homework, in the study guide. There's a chart you have to fill out. What's produced in photosynthesis, what's used in photosynthesis. It's, it's, really, it's, just, it's just simple. Oxygen is produced in photosystem 2. Breakdown of water. Oxygen comes from water, not from carbon dioxide. But I'm glad you made that guess, because making an error now is perfect. Now's the time to make the mistake. Those of you that are quietly sitting there are quietly failing. So you want to be successful, you need to, stay, you need to take some risks. So there you have, uh, where's, the, where's the CO2 going though? Carbon dioxide, where's it going? Where in photosynthesis? There's three, you have a quiz at the end of this, do you know that? And the Calvin cycle's correct. Excellent. By what enzyme? What enzyme fixes carbon dioxide? Rubisco. So Rubisco takes in the photosynthesis, carbon dioxide fixes it, and the Calvin cycle makes it into a sugar. It's just that simple. That's all. You don't need to know any of the intermediate forms. You, need, you, need, you do need to know what the Calvin cycle uses. It uses carbon dioxide. What else? What else does the Calvin cycle use? Carbon dioxide takes in from the air does not use water. I'll say it for the third time in about t five minutes. Water is used in photosystem two, the first step in the photosynthetic reactions. It's the breakdown of water that produces oxygen and gives the electrons to the electron transport chain. Are we clear?
carbon dioxide is in the Calvin cycle. Completely different set of reactions in a completely different part of the chloroplast. Carbon dioxide is fixed by Rubisco. An enzyme in the chloroplast. Fixing means it, it gets taken from gas form and gets attached to another molecule. That's what this is the source of carbon for sugars. You will get a quiz on all this at the end of this lesson. There's a quiz on Juno you're going to have to do. That's why you have the computers in front of you, just so you know. Yes, ma'am. A quiz every day, every other day. I told you that. Carbon dioxide can be taken. That's the carbon that's used in sugar. So that's, what's, that's where sugar is made. This is the, the source of food here is carbon dioxide. The source of carbon for sugar is carbon dioxide. The source of energy that gets put into that sugar is the sun. Are we clear on this? And you see here, carbon dioxide goes into the plant, but where, what's coming out of the rabbit? Oxygen comes out of the rabbit? You're right, but not really. What comes out of the rabbit is carbon dioxide. It comes out of, out of the rabbit because out of animals comes carbon dioxide because we produce it. We don't do photosynthesis. We don't use carbon dioxide. We get rid of it. Plants do use carbon dioxide, but they also use oxygen. I'm going to say that. This is like the eighth time I've said it, so I would think it's important. One of those things that you should put in your study guide, if you're making a study guide, and you will, for your final and for your exam this Friday. Oxygen is used by both, but carbon dioxide is produced by rabbits, but not used by animals, and not used. It's expelled into the atmosphere, which is then taken up by plants. This is carbon, D is carbon, E is oxygen, E is oxygen, so there's D carbon, E is oxygen. Notice that that means you're going to color code them different colors, aren't you? So here's E, what are these? Oxygen. These are oxygens. Two oxygens together make what gas? Oxygen. Two atoms of oxygen together make a molecule of oxygen. That's the gas you breathe in. This is how you breathe it in. You don't breathe in single atoms. Well, you do, but that's not what you use. You use oxygen gas. It gets breathed in by the rabbit and used in cellular respiration. Does anybody know where oxygen is used? And anybody do their homework? Does it? Where is oxygen used in the, by the rabbit, by the cells of the rabbit? In what in what stage of cellular respiration? It's used in the electron transport chain. It's the final electron acceptor. And what is it used to make? I would be writing these questions. If I'm asking you this question, I, I understand you don't know the answer. I respect that. You should be writing the question down. Me asking a question and answering it for myself, that's just a waste of everybody's time. I'm glad you are. And don't lie to yourself and say, I'm just going to listen to this at home and then not listen to it. Yeah, I know what people do. I do too. Oxygen comes in. Oxygen goes in. Where is it going to be used in the, in the electron transport chain? It's the final electron acceptor. You make water. Water gets excreted by the rabbit. They pee it out or they, they sweat it out. Same as humans. Yes, animals pee. Yes, animals sweat. I'm sorry that that upsets you. So you, so that's what oxygen do. Oxygen is going to be mixed with hydrogen in the as the electron at the final electron acceptor is going to take that electron. Where did photo, when did we get the electron to make oxygen in photosynthesis? We got it from the carbon dioxide. Wow. No, we got, it from the water. got it from the water. Thank you. <laughs> Photosynthesis, you get, you get the electron from water, you produce oxygen, respiration, you give an electron, it's the last electron acceptor, and you produce water. Isn't that beautiful? Yes, it's so beautiful. That is a beautiful symmetry there. Beautiful. Can we stop, separate yourselves, and get, let's stop right now. Separate yourselves from that group. 
I, I need you focused, not just commenting to comment. No, I'm really glad you it is a it is a it's a gorgeous little system that's been around for for a few billion years and could theoretically be around for billions more. Maybe not billions since plants. I don't know. But a long time. It could be around for a long time to come. As, as heterotrophs, those are animals, right? Heterotrophs, things that don't make their own energy, their own food. And autotrophs, things that make their own food, share the resources. They cycle the resources. Not only are the electrons recycled, but the oxygen's recycled, and the hydrogen's recycled, and the water is recycled. Isn't it? Round and round. So you don't ever, you're never going to run out of water as long as you have plants and animals around together. Just going to keep, wow, okay. So I is a thing, and C is a thing, and H is a thing, and G is a thing, and you can, you can look them up here in the key. You'll see C is the plant, and G is the, and you can see E G is the carbohydrate. And the carbohydrate that's this symbol usually is glucose, right? Produced by the plant, right? One of the things the plant produces. All right, so this is a good summary and a good look at what energy is supposed to be. Let's look at something called metabolism. Metabolism is divided into two parts. And you can, you can read it yourself and look at what the definition is. You can read, I'm assuming you can read on your own, and you can. Metabolism is basically the sum of all the energy processes, right? All the building, all the, all the activities of living things is called metabolism. So if you have metabolism, it's all the pluses and all the minuses added together. That's what metabolism is. I should not write it up there, I guess. When you, when you metabolize something, you're either breaking it down or you're building it up. That's the only two things you do. You either break them down or you build them up. And the, thing, some, the example that is for breaking it down, what we call, well, let's talk about first building it up. Has anybody heard of anabolic steroids? No. Those are steroids that muscle builders use to build muscle. That's because the process is called anabolism. By the way, they're very dangerous. You should not take them. They have all kinds of side effects, including cancer, which is the worst, but there's also all the kinds of things that are lifelong issues. Because they build muscle. They think that muscle building is more important than anything else. They're dedicated to that task. They're sacrificed. If Once you stop taking the anabolic steroids, things like uh, men growing breast tissues, growing hips, uh, testicles shrinking, those kinds of side effects do occur. Sterility, cancer, increased risk of cancer. Heart issues, high blood pressure. I mean, the, the list goes on. Anabolic steroids are a big deal. Mood swings, psychotic breaks. You've heard of roid rage. I don't know if you've heard of that. That's where... People that are on anabolic steroids actually lose touch with reality and, and have fits of rage. And they're even more dangerous because they're very muscular, obviously. So anabolic, anabolism is the process of building. You do this. You, you produce these anabolic steroids. That's good. When you work out, you produce more of these steroids. That's a natural level. It's the synthetic stuff that you pump into your veins that can cause issues. Does that make sense? You do this because you were one cell. At one point, you were a single cell, and you grew into what you are today. You grew muscles. You're growing right now. You're ninth graders. As you go into tenth grade, you'll get bigger and taller and stronger. And these are the things that are going to happen to you, and you've been doing that since you were born, right? And that's called anabolism, building up, putting together amino acids to make proteins, putting proteins together to make muscle, putting muscles together to make muscle groups, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, anabolism is building. I'm listening. Catabolism 
is what? What do you think catabolism is? Breaking down. Breaking down. And what is it, what do you, where do you break things down in your body? What do you have to break down? The simplest thing you have to break down. Food, including fat. When you eat food, you eat a tur- you ate turkey over Thanksgiving. That turkey you ate, those of you that, whatever it is you ate, whatever it is you ate, I don't really care. It's an example. You ate turkey during Thanksgiving. It had, pro- it had protein. You broke that protein out. I can't, I can't cut you open and find a turkey leg in your arm, can I? That doesn't, it's not how you absorb things. It's not how you digest things. You take that muscle that you ate. You're eating muscle when you eat turkey. You take that muscle, you break it down into amino acids. And then you use those amino acids to build up. So you break things down to their very basic level. And then you base, their very basic compounds. And then you build up with those compounds yourself. That's called digestion. When you eat a potato, you don't take in the starch and then use the starch. You break the starch up into glucose. Then you use the glucose. You're using the components of what you eat. You have to be able to break it down. So digestion is one thing. You're also, when you don't use muscle, have you ever seen anyone in a wheelchair? And in the long term, in movies especially, you'll see it. What happens to their muscles and their legs? They start to atrophy. It's called atrophy. They shrink. But they don't shrink, they don't get smaller. What do they, what get, what happens? Think of context. What happens? Catabolism. Your body's not using, what does your body say? Oh, we don't need it? Okay. Chop it up and let's use the amino acids. So your, your body starts to eat itself, digest itself, break it down. It's natural. You're starving. Your body needs amino acids. Where's it going to get amino acids? You. Your own muscles. Hopefully not your heart. Hopefully your skeletal muscles first. And this is what happens. You break your start to do catabolism. So those of you that like to go for long periods of time without eating, don't eat well, you just starve yourself, and then you eat a little bit, you starve yourself, you're actually hurting yourself, and you're actually making yourself fatter. There's more fat on you than muscle. Because as you destroy your muscle... You destroy the, the number one thing that uses up that, that energy. Not only do you become weaker, you also use up the, the, your ability, you get rid of your ability to use calories. So anytime you take in extra calories, it goes directly to fat. So catabolism and anabolism, together they form metabolism. Let's take a look then at the basic molecules that we just were talking about, right? Anabolism is making more complex molecules from simple molecules. So this protein is made by anabolism. From what? What's a protein made of? I literally just said it about two minutes ago, three minutes ago. What's a protein made of? You should know this. This is something you should know immediately. It's a polymer of what? Not glucose of amino acids. So proteins are polymers of amino acids. Starch is a a polymer of what? Somebody said it a minute ago. Glucose. Why don't we, why don't we get up and go and what, and you know what, while we're at it, I'm going to go ahead and and start this procedure. I wanted to do it earlier. I'm going to pause this in a minute. I'll call your parent and we'll discuss why you're out of dress code and interrupting my class. So that's number one. Of course, I'll give you detention. Why don't you get in the dress code, move over here to this side of the room. Why don't, Miss Trina, why don't you get yourself together and move yourself over here to this side up front. And let's try that. And you can continue to take off that hoodie as well, Miss Trina. So these amino acids put together to make a polymer. These, star, these glucose molecules put together to make starch. So to make starch, you did anabolism, the plant did animalism because starch is a plant. And by the way, that's something that's on the final, people. And the proteins made of animalism, both plants and animals make proteins. They both plants and animals take amino acids and they put them together to make these polymers. 
DNA is made of nucleotides. These are complex molecules made by anabolism. Anabolic reactions make these complicated molecules. Large polymers. Did someone leave the room? Wow. A fat is made again, another example of one of those polymers, one of those complicated molecules made of carbon chains. Phospholipids, an example. These are all made by anabolo anabolic reactions. These can get broken down. What are these made of? They're made of hydrogen, water, carbon dioxide. That's where these, these basic components are what make these complicated molecules. So if you eat this, you break it down. When you, when you build them, you put these together to go in the opposite direction. Catabolism, anabolism. How did you bring them in? What process did you use to bring them into your cells? Food is what's out here. How did you bring it into the cell? How did you get it into the cell? This is through the cell membrane using what process? I was just on the last test. Nope. Endocytosis. So endocytosis brings in the cell where you can then break it down. So that's fine for matter. That's okay. We understand that, or at least some people do. Let's take a look at energy. This book sitting up here, I, what does it have a lot of? Potential energy. Potential energy. This book falling has a lot of what? Kinetic. kinetic, and as it falls, it gets more kinetic and less potential until it gets to the bottom. Now here's a book at the bottom. How is this? How's this person getting the book from the bottom to the top? It's using that's true, but it's using this book's potential energy to move this book. It's coupling the reaction. It's coupling the falling of this book to raise this book. Do you see that? This book falling. What just happened? Yeah. Do I have tissue? No. Can we take that head off, though? So this book falling raises this book. This is called coupling. You're coupling a, a, an, an, an action. This is very important. The idea that you can take an action, one action can make another thing happen. This falling is raising this book. Remember that as we move forward. Really the most important part of here is this idea of transforming energy and changes of energy. The word changes of energy, really what we're talking about is transforming energy. We cannot destroy or create energy. That's the first law of thermodynamics. It's a, kind of a basic reality that we exist in this universe where we cannot create or destroy energy as human beings. But we are able to change energy from one form to the other. That's the key here. And most things that you see, when you eat a burger or you eat a candy bar, you drink an energy drink. You're taking chemical energy and you're changing it many different times to, in order for you to get to that movement, the mechanical energy. All right. So when we talk about thermodynamics, we're talking about the the idea of thermal being heat and dynamic being movement, right? So the thermodynamics is a study of of energy or heat and movement. And again, we talked about the first law of thermodynamics and the second law of thermodynamics. Color code these, and we've talked about the idea of the energy in a system before a reaction has to equal the energy in the system after the reaction. A lot of you have in the past balanced equations. Some of you have not, but we've talked about balanced equations. I think we've done at least photosynthesis. We balanced that equation. 
What you have in the beginning, you have to have in the end. They have to be equal. Is that clear? That's just a, it's a reality. The second law of thermodynamics just talks about how entropy increases, how that's just natural. Things are always, entropy is always, things are going to decay unless you do what? Yeah, you have process energy in order to keep up the order. In order to keep order, you have to exchange chaos, energy for chaos. You have to get rid of chaos and, and put order to things. It takes energy to do that. And so you take this molecule gasoline that your mother and father pump into your car periodically, and you can take that gas and that energy, that chemical energy, and the bonds between the carbon. These are long-chain carbon it's a long chain of carbons, all connected to each other, carbon and hydrogen, some oxygen, but mostly carbon and hydrogen. And then you add some, some oxygen, right? And you burn it, and out comes water and CO2. This, this, is, this reaction is called combustion. That releases energy. That energy, that, that gas expanding, moves a turbine. That turbine moving makes electricity. That electricity powers the house. This is a generator. Is that clear? So this generator is making electricity for this house by taking the chemical energy in the gasoline and turning it into electrical energy using a process called induction. We don't need to learn that right now, but this is just the idea that you're going from this chemical energy to mechanical energy to electrical energy, and then maybe you have a vacuum cleaner in here where you take that electrical energy, you change it again to chemical energy or to mechanical energy. So over and over again, you're just taking these energies and you're changing them from one form to the other. And every time you do, you have the ability to get some work done. You get some work done. Remember, work is force time, force times distance. Is that clear? Yeah. Question. So entropy is chaos, right? Yeah, okay. within the system, right? So in entropy, the universe always is moving towards chaos, towards ab absolute disorder. But your life, but life is not disorder. We learn that the quality of life, one of the qualities of life, one of the things that you can point to, to something and say, that's a rock, it's not alive. And this is a person, that person is alive. It's not because they can talk, although that makes them more like us, right? But it's not because they can talk or move. There are people that are alive that can't move or talk. But there are... But it's that they have order. That, that unlike the rock, they're not falling apart. They're using energy in the form of food, because we're, he we're heterotrophs, right? We don't make our own. We're not autotrophs. We're head to, so we're taking food energy, chemical energy, and we're, we're, we're creating order from, from disorder. We're taking and building ourselves up. Does that make sense? Am I making sense to you? Do you have any questions? Is it confusing? So this is just background information. I'm not going to ask you, let me be clear, I'm not going to ask you the first law of thermodynamics. I'm not going to ask you the second law of thermodynamics. I'm not going to ask you about transforming you, but you do need to know that energy is transformed in, under, in order to understand cellular respiration and photosynthesis. Yeah? So, when something has order, then they learn to it, It's one of the qualities of life, right? So, all right, this is a good question. If I say something is a tree, I know that I have cellulose in it, right? But nobody in this room is going to call this sheet of paper a tree, right? Even though it's made of cellulose. It came from a tree, but it's not a tree, right? So the fact that it is cellulose is a quality that it shares with a tree. Does that make sense? So a system having order, having more order than what's out in the universe, going in the opposite direction of what the universe is going towards. That order is a quality of life, but it doesn't define life, right? There are other qualities that, that help define it. Let's talk about that. 
compartmentalization, cells. Cell theory says that cell, that the basic unit of life is a cell. So if it doesn't have a cell, it's not alive, right? So cells, uh, order, uh, processing energy, has some kind of hereditary information that it can pass on to its progeny and who, who it, it got from its parents, right? Does that make sense? <coughs> the ability to reproduce and make more of themselves internally, grow. These are all qualities of life. Yeah? I was just going to say, oh, the DNA. Oh, yeah, DNA. Yeah, it has, life has DNA. There, uh, you might argue it could have RNA. And certainly the first life might have had RNA instead of, and no DNA. But it has something that allows it to send its information from one generation to the next. Right? Otherwise it's not alive. Because that's what life does. We send our, our pieces and parts. All of you have parents. All of you have information your parents had that made you help make you who you are. You're made in part, not all of you. It's not the whole story. And you'll learn that things are much more complicated than, than most people think. In fact, I doubt there's many people that understand how complicated genetics really are. It really is. But the bottom line is that you have some information that gets sent from one generation to the next. And that gen information is continuously sent. There's a connection between us and our ancestors and us and our future us's. Yeah? Yeah, bacteria have order. They're alive. They're cells. They have cells. They're simpler. Remember our discussion about prokaryotes. Proca we talked about what the quality. What we talked about some of the some of the uh, the classifications of life, right? Eukaryote, prokaryote. Eukaryotes are broken up into what? Fungi, animals, plants, proteins, right? Prokaryotes are broken up into bacteria and archaebacteria. These are forms of life. Those are forms of life. Those are the, the yeah. Then what would viruses be considered? That's a, great, that's a great question. That's still not decided. There's a lot of people arguing both back on both sides. In fact, I'm going to say something that may be wrong because I haven't read anything on it recently. But I, I would say most people do not consider viruses alive. They're, they are, re, they are re, most scientists, right? But by most, I mean I don't know. I can't even come up with a percentage. <coughs> even if it's sixty percent, I would go with most. That's how close it is. There's a lot of people that argue viruses are alive. They argue we have to change our, our definition of life. We have to stop saying that life is uh, that the cell is the basic unit of life because a virus does, is not a cell. Is that clear? A virus is not a cell. Although some viruses do have some type of membrane, they, they're not anything like a cell as we know it. Yeah? Can viruses live on their own? No, they do not live on their own. Viruses, viruses can't reproduce. They don't have the machinery. They don't have ribosomes. They don't have... If they have, usually they have either DNA or RNA, they do. Uh, and different viruses have different components. Some viruses have proteins, and, and um, some viruses have membranes, very thin, uh, 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 but not membranes, that, that not a fluid mosaic model with, with membranes that process and enzymes and things. Very few enzymes or uh, viruses have a lot of structure and function. In fact, they're just a capsule of DNA. Think of a think of a pill of DNA that just floating in the in the. They don't react. They don't react to the environment, which is another another quality of life. If I go over and I poke you in the eye, you're going to get upset, right? You're going to react somehow. You might cry. You might slap me. But the bottom line is, if I poke you in the eye, you're going to react, right? You can poke a virus all day. Nothing's going to happen. But if you take it, what happens is that your cells take up the virus and make, and then there's information on that virus that says, make more copies of me. And then your cells make copies. They make everything the virus is. They make the capsule. They make the, they make all the components. They copy the DNA. They do, your cells make more viruses. The virus hijacks your cells. 
So, but it's just an information, just a, a bit of information on DNA. Is that is that clear? That that's surrounded by a protein coat, possibly some some uh, 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 some kind of capsule, but it's not a cell. It can't live on itself. Can't. It doesn't make ATP. Doesn't do cellular respiration. Doesn't do photosynthesis. It can't do any of that. It can't make more of itself by itself. It can't do any of that. It does have hereditary information though. So that's why people argue most, again, I say most without really knowing, most people, most scientists argue it's not a, it's not a, it's not a lie. But this is a debate that's actively going on, to my knowledge. All right, so now let's stick on, on task here. Here's a couple, so this idea of coupling reactions, and what I mean by coupling reactions, remember the big book falling, pulling up the little book, right, in the previous picture. This idea of coupling reactions allows us to use the energy, energy released from one reaction to drive another reaction. So the energy of that book falling, the big book falling, pulled up the other book. So here's coupled reactions. Here's a, here's a glucose molecule turning into glucose 1-phosphate. This, this is one of the steps of, of, of processing the glucose molecule, right? Those of you that, that looked at, at cellular respiration. Again, you're going to color code these, but I'm going to quickly color code them. This is a ribose sugar. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. All right. And then, and yeah, do you have to know what ribose sugar? No, guys. I don't expect you to be able to draw this out or even identify it on multiple choice. I just want you to see how complicated these structures are. I want you to look at this and draw them and think about what they are. I want you to think. So here's, rib here's the ribose sugar as well. Oops. So there's this ribose sugar, and then it, and on it on it there's this nitrogenous base. The nitrogenous base here is adenine, right? Do you remember that? What what is this thing that I'm that I'm coloring in? What is the whole molecule called? ATP is right. A is a, the adenosine. This is adenosine. Not adenine. Adenosine. So there's a there's the uh, there's the molecule as we know it. Then of course attached to that are three phosphates: phosphorus with four oxygen. There's a phosphorus with four oxygen. There's one that would make it AMP. Two that would make it ADP. And three, that would make it ATP. So there's ATP. Do you see that? Adenosine triphosphate. If you colored this last night, you'd know that. This is this here, of course, is, is sugar, glucose, C6H12O6, and you can count it yourself and find out. Six-sided sugar. You should know that by now. I'm coloring it very quickly because we've got to get a move in. Now, ATP easily turns into ADP. This is a very highly energetic molecule. It wants to fall apart. It does not want to have three phosphates on it. They're all pushing away from each other. They want to break apart. It's like a stick of dynamite or a bottle of nitroglycerin. Drop a bottle of nitroglycerin, it'll explode. It does not want to be nitroglycerin. It wants to be something much simpler. It wants to be that driving force of the universe that's moving towards entropy, so it's breaking apart. There it is. It wants to break apart. And I say want, you realize that these things don't think or feel, right? There's the, the energetic profile, the energy profile of this molecule is, that, is such that it does not want to hold together. So this phosphate, wants, it will fall off. It will release energy, what it does. So as it falls off, ATP comes in contact with the glucose in the presence of an enzyme. There has to be an enzyme. Remember, you have to know what enzymes are for the final. That'll be one of the things on your... So there's this enzyme here. That's going to allow this, these two to come together in, in the right position. And then this phosphate is going to fall off, and it's going to get attached here. Do you see it? There's the phosphate here. It falls off, 
leaving you with only two phosphates on. So what is this now became? ATP became what? ADP. ATP became ADP. Two phosphates, adenosine, adenosine diphosphate. So now this sugar is now no longer just sugar. It's not just glucose. It's, it's glucose one phosphate. Why do you think we put the one Again, remember, you don't have to memorize this. I just want you to see what's going on. This is a, a process that example, exemplifies coupling reactions. Here's a, here's a glucose molecule. Remember, this is zero. I, told you how to, I taught you how to number of carbons on a, in a ring. There's zero. This is carbon one, two, three, four, five, six. So carbons one through six. Carbon one has what attached to it? A phosphate. All right. So glucose one phosphate, easy. Our name, the name, the nomenclature is not difficult. You can see it and call it if you know the rules. So here's fructose. We want to put fructose. We want to add it to glucose in order to make what? Sucrose. So the the idea here is to make sucrose. How do you make sucrose? If you have your Your glucose molecule, you have your fructose molecule. How are you going to make glucose? I mean, sucrose. Well, you're going to need energy. Where are you getting the energy? Look at this and tell me, where is the energy coming from? Is there any ATP used when you put together these two? No. When we transferred that phosphate on here, we made this molecule unstable. There's a lot of energy here. There's a lot of energy in this bond. If it comes into contact with fructose, again... Using what? Some type of enzyme. A protein, usually a protein, usually a protein that helps reduce the activation energy by, by coupling or grabbing molecules and, putting, and bringing, bringing them together. It could take this glucose 1-phosphate and this fructose and bring them together, and when it does, the phosphate falls off. That energy then allows these two to be bonded together. So now you have glucose bonded to uh, this glucose bonded to hold on a second bonded to this to this fructose. So fructose and glucose bonded together make sucrose, which is table sugar. So by, by coupling reactions, by taking this ATP going to ADP, that coupling it to, allows us to, to make this high-energy glucose molecule. This high-energy glucose molecule comes in contact with fructose in the presence of an enzyme. Phosphate falls off and allows the two to be bonded together into one molecule called sucrose. This is how we, this is how, what happens throughout the whole your whole, every cell in your body a trillion times a day, very quickly. But the point is what? Energy from one change going in one direction, from here to here, for instance, drives, the ener drives a reaction that changes glucose to glucose 1-phosphate. The energy from glucose 1-phosphate releasing that phosphate, in other words, falling, phosphate falling off, drives the reaction of glucose and fructose coming together to form sucrose. Yes? Um, so the hydrogen yeah, there's all, there's all kinds of little things that are going on that, I, that I'm trying not to discuss. So yeah, you're right. There's a, there's a, there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of, uh, of smaller things that are going on. Hydrogen's leaving, electrons moving, etc. There's a lot of stuff. Like you could spend organic chemistry, this is a biochemistry, organic chemistry, some of the, some people find it the hardest thing in the world to learn. And we could have a discussion on it, but it would just be a waste of our time because it's not really the stuff that's on your exam. It's not a waste of time, but it's not in the, moving in the direction that we need to move right now. In the future, when you're in college and you're learning organic chemistry, you will learn where every electron goes and what happens to each and the type of changes that happen. And there's names for each change. There's names for each change of each bond and how they change and what they do and when they do it and how much energy is released and there's all kinds of things you're going to have to learn. So it's a really great question but it's, it's a little deeper and we need to go right now.
All right. Doesn't look like we're doing the quiz today. You'll have to do it tomorrow. Be ready for this quiz. It's cellular respiration. You have to know your cellular respiration. You go first, please. Yeah, but this is not. This stuff so far is not on the quiz. The stuff that's on the quiz is the stuff that you went over, over. Thanksgiving. And then hopefully we'll be able to go over tomorrow before, during class. We're not done yet. We still got four minutes. So let's finish what we can. So here again is adenosine triphosphate. So there's, again, you're going to color code these, right? Adenosine triphosphate. And you have to find it. Here's these, here are these basic molecules. Each one of these is about energy transfer. What is this here? What do you think this is here? It's a sperm. It needs what? What does a sperm need? It needs energy. It has mitochondria because it needs ATP. It needs energy. You're right, it needs a mitochondria because it needs a lot of them. That's what's in its tail, a lot of mitochondria because it needs a lot of energy because it's moving. This is a muscle this is a muscle fibers, this is muscle contraction. Look, ADP, there it is, two phosphates. What is this? ATP is turning into ADP and can be used then by coupling to make energy. That energy can be used for active transport. That's what's drawn here, right? It can be used for muscle contractions, which is what some of you are doing right now as you fidget in your seats. It can be used for a flagella uh, moving through a fluid, like in, a, in, this, in the case of a sperm. It could be used, that energy could be used to take glucose and put a phosphate on it and turn it, a, and, uh, and turn it into something else. It, that, a, that ATP could turn, you could use that, it could release the phosphate and put it to sugar to form another molecule down here. A glucose one phosphate or glucose two phosphate. You could you could take this molecule here and combine G and A. What is A? A is adenosine, and what's G? What is uh, what's Q? It's an AMP <laughs> AMP amino acid complex. Now, do I expect you to know all these crazy molecules? No, I do not. I expect you to know ATP, ADP, yes. I do expect you to know glucose. You should know that by now. You should know AMP You should know, you could know AMP. I probably won't ask it, but you should know. I mean, it's easy. Uh, active transport stuff that we covered a lot, right? This other stuff, it's good that you see it. It's good that you understand how complicated this can be and how many different ways we can use ATP. But the purpose is not to have you memorize all these different molecules. You will have to memorize these. Those of you who want to be physicians, you will have to know these steps and these different molecules. But you don't have to know them now. I hate when you put stuff away and I'm not done talking. It's just rude. I would have just said, I literally would have, if you would have waited two more seconds, I would have said, calmly put your stuff away. Putting your stuff away before the speaker is done is rude. You will not gain any friends or respect from your professors in college if you do that. Wait until he or she releases or stops speaking and says, okay, we're done for today. Okay? All right. You can raise your hand and say, professor, it's time to go. That's fair. When you're in college. Obviously, I'm not a professor. Are we all good? All right. We'll finish this tomorrow night. Say the end. Not even. Uh, this is not something for high school. So that question is much deeper than, than that. All right, so enzymes. Enzymes have, what they do is they, they reduce the activation energy. We talked about this. Who's, see, who's ever used hydrogen peroxide at home on a cut or on something? What did you notice? It burns a little bit, not nothing like alcohol. Right. It has a little tingle, if anything. But what's what's interesting is that the reason that this that that's happening is that there's this enzyme. So what happens is hydrogen peroxide, is H two O two, will turn will release uh, a gas. It'll release oxygen gas and water. So that's what's going to end up happening. 
But, and that happens naturally. If you look at a bottle of hydrogen peroxide, a couple bubbles will show up all on their own. That gas is produced naturally, falls apart. But it doesn't happen easily. However, if you take hydrogen peroxide and you put it, and this is a poison. Hydrogen peroxide, it's a killer. We produce it in our body sometimes, and so we need a way to get rid of it because we don't want... We produce alcohol. Alcohol is a poison. Alcohol kills, right? If you drink. That's why you use alcohol on your, on your cuts. Why? What are you trying to do? You're, You're trying to kill bacteria. You're trying, it's a killer. Alcohol is a killer. That's why it's not a good idea to drink it, by the way, but whatever. <laughs> it's, there, in, in fact, the reason we started drinking it as, human, as a species is because the, the bacteria in our water supply was killing us. So we mixed the wine... And most people that drank wine back in the day didn't drink pure wine. They'd take the wine and mix it in with the water. And after, in places where wine wasn't a very good option, they would use beer, any kind of alcohol. Alcohol was mixed with water in order to purify the water. So it really wasn't, you didn't drink the water. The alcohol obviously has a pleasant side effect, right? People get drunk. <laughs> And so people, and unfortunately, there's, there, it, it's an addiction. People do get addicted to alcohol as well. It's called alcoholism. So there's some real serious issues with al using alcohol, especially today since we have other ways of purifying our water. But, but cleaning up our water supply is a real big deal. A big kill. In fact, people in Europe thought didn't take baths often because they were afraid of the water. It went rightfully so. There's a, there were a lot of killers in the water as well. They didn't take baths for years. Like they would take a bath once a year, if then. The Queen of England died with a thick paste of makeup, or France, I can't remember, one of the two. Thick paste of uh, makeup on her skin because they kept putting makeup on but never washed it off. You think it's nasty, but listen to what I'm saying. The water was worse. There's bacteria... And viruses in the water that would kill you and let you die in a horrible, horrible way. <laughs> oh, man. So you got to think about that. You got to think about that. Why, so the, there are reasons why people do it. Now, the, the, in Japan, what they would do is they would, they made tea, right? They boiled the water. Well, it's just it's the way. It's just naturally how it happened. It turns out alcohol has a pleasant side effect, and it purifies water. Let's go with that. Whatever works, right? So, anyways, H two O two, nat is a killer. So we have to have a way to get rid of it. We don't want it in our body. So there's this enzyme. Here is this enzyme. I'm going to keep drawing it. A, an enzyme, and it's just a protein that folds, takes that water. You know what it does? Is it? And the reason it doesn't that hydrogen peroxide normally does not happen. So if we have this, this chart, you need to know this chart for your final. You need to be able to write, read something like this. And this is time. As it turns out, I don't know why I put enzyme. Because I was thinking enzyme, I think. So if you have this energy... You have a certain amount of energy in H2O2. If you raise the energy to a certain point, it will, the bonds will break and it, it will release that energy. And at the end, so here you start off with H2O2. In the end, you end up with oxygen gas and water. So that's a chemical reaction, right? The changing, moving the bonds around. Does that make sense? Uh, this is not balanced. Does everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not going to balance it because we don't have time, but it's, it's not balanced. I don't want to mess around with it. I just want you to focus on one other thing. This is where the energy started. Whatever the number is, I don't care. There's, you might have to read it on a chart, but whatever. You can read a chart. You can read a number. This is where the energy started. You had to raise that energy up this much in order to get H2O2 to... to turn into this. That's not, normally doesn't happen. If you put it in a glass, there's not enough energy 
to do that. You could boil it, and it would turn into water and release oxygen. Or you can do what your body does, this enzyme called catalase. And catalase, and this is this found in just about every, uh, in, in a lot of different uh, organisms. There's it's found in onions. It's found in your bloodstream. It's found in blood, in any blood, really. Hydrogen peroxide is a common molecule that, that it's a common byproduct that's dangerous to any living thing. It, 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 it's not good. So a lot of living things have this thing called catalase, an enzyme, and protein, that does this. It reduces the amount of energy necessary to break hydrogen peroxide down. Now, when that hydrogen peroxide touches your blood, there's catalase in there. Now, all of a sudden, instead of just a couple little bubbles, it might happen in a glass of hydrogen peroxide. Now, it just fizzes like crazy. Why is it fizzing like crazy? Because it only requires a little bit of energy. Why did it require only a little bit of energy to happen? Because the activation energy, that's what this is called. The activation energy has been reduced. What reduced it? The catalase. The catalase reduced it. So enzymes reduce enzymes reduce activation the activation energy required. To allow a, re a chemical reaction to go. And it's all here. You can read it. And by the way, here are the charts. There's a chart. I drew it out all out there. But here it is. The speed of the reaction. Actually, put speed of the reaction. So you're, what happens is with, with, in the presence of an enzyme, the speed of the reaction increases. Okay? In the presence of, uh, of an enzyme, the speed of reaction increases because the enzyme literally brings the two reactants together. It, it, it allows for the best possible circumstance for the reaction to move on. So only a small amount of activation energy is required. So think about it. And by the way, an enzyme is also known as a catalyst. All right, a catalyst. Catalase, there it is, catalase is an enzyme. Manganese dioxide, manganese dioxide is also known as a catalyst. This is an inorganic catalyst. In other words, catalase is a protein. Those are what we call biological catalysts. All catalysts do the same thing. They all reduce that activation energy. An enzyme is a biological catalyst. It reduces the activation energy. Yeah? Does it reduce it by absorbing it? It does it by, by bringing the, the molecules together. So if you, if you think of a billion molecules all floating around in a, in a, in a glass of, of hydrogen pro, of, of fluid, mm -hmm. and you, in order for you to react with her, you have to come into contact with each other. Well, it's random. So the more heat you add, the more you're moving around, the more likely it is that you'll meet and react. But what an enzyme does, what any catalyst does, manganese dioxide in this case, or the catalase enzyme, whatever it is, it's going to do with this, it's going to bring the two things together. It's going to bring you and her together, physically, by temporarily attaching to both of you. It's not involved in the reaction. It doesn't react itself. It doesn't go away. It brings the two things that are going to react together. It's like a matchmaker. You've heard of matchmakers? It's the person, like if you, if you, if you, I can't pick a human being in here because if John and Samantha were each looking for somebody to fall in love with and marry, right? And they can't find anyone. There's a billion people out there. They've, got, they've done speed dating. They can't find, I mean, it's hard to find people. It takes a lot of energy. They don't have it. They don't have a lot of money. They don't have a lot of time, right? So they come to me. I'm the matchmaker. I know both of them. I'm like, okay, well, I know, I know this girl named Samantha. I know this guy named John. They, you both, I think you guys could match. You could match up pretty well. I bring you together, right? If you guys do get married, let's assume you do. This is a chemical reaction, so we'll just assume it's going to happen. They come together. You do get married, right? I'm not marrying you. 
When they're married, those two are married, they go have babies. I'm not involved in any of that, am I? I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm looking now, this is my job, so I'm looking for two other people to bring together, right? So I can make my money. That's an, how an enzyme or how the catalyst works. An enzyme or catalyst does not get involved in the reaction itself. What it does is it brings the two reactants together. Does that make sense? The two things that are going to react, that are in this case going to break apart sometimes, is to build them together. You just saw in the previous slide, you saw that glucose and phosphate were brought together. How were they brought together? How did the phosphate end up on the glucose? The two enzyme, the enzyme brought them together, and the chemical reaction happened. Is that clear? So that's how enzymes work. The enzyme not in, does not actually covalently bond to anything. It brings everything together and allows it to happen. It goes back to his starting point over and over. So to be clear, when an enzyme, an enzyme requires a specific shape in order to match its reactants to bring them together. Is that clear? Yeah. And when an enzyme, if it has a specific shape, like let's say it, it looks like this, and then you have a, you have a reactant that looks like that. And it's going to bring it together with another reactant that looks like that. Now, can you see that this area here is going to fit this here? Do you see that this area here fits this area here? Okay. So those two are going to get together, and when they get together, this enzyme then is able to bond to these two substrates. We call these substrates or reactants. And these two things can come together and do their reaction, produce whatever that is. Is that clear? Okay. But if you increase the temperature, this is a protein. This is not a, a, a rock. This is a protein. If you increase the temperature past a certain point, this protein... The hydrogen bonds that hold it together, remember hydrogen bonds? Those little weak bonds that hold a specific, hold, give this thing a specific shape. If you, if those hydrogen bonds are broken because you increase the temperature past a certain point, the hydrogen bonds break down and this thing unravels. Unravels. And it doesn't work because what happens is that, and we call that denaturing. It's, let me write that down so everybody gets it. So that's normal. At its normal temperature range, all right, which could be whatever, right? It's normal temperature range. The enzymes work and everything's fine. Maybe it's maybe it's from I don't know twenty degrees to uh, fifty five degrees. Maybe that's it. Celsius. That's it. In that range, the enzyme's fine. It keeps its shape. It might work best at a certain... It might start to lose its shape when it gets near 20, so it doesn't work as well. It might start to lose... It might be at its best at 55. I don't know. Whatever. But it's, this is the range where the enzyme keeps its shape. Beyond 55, after it reaches 55, the enzyme starts to unravel. Is it gonna is it gonna bond to these? Uh, is it gonna be able to bond to these things? No. It won't be able to bond to them because uh, it won't be able to bond to them because it doesn't have because it doesn't have the proper shape. So if it doesn't have the proper shape, it can't it can't bond to what it has to bond in order to do it. So this this. Uh, these reactants then, these reactants are going to be left without a, uh, these reactants are going to be left without being able to have an enzyme to help it get along, and so they're just going to stay like they are. They're never going to react. Is that clear? Yeah. So this is called denaturing. These have been denatured. Now you can denature them with heat, you can also denature them with salt, increasing salt concentration, uh, not subtle, salt, or decreasing or increasing pH. 
So there's an optimum range. There's a range of temperature that's optimum, that's the best. You know, optimus prime, right? The best. Uh, there's a pH range. Maybe it's 6.5 to 7.5. Maybe that's the pH range that's the best, that works. And there's going to be also a, a, a salt concentration. There's going to be a concentration of salt that works well. And if you go above or beyond it, it's, it's going to be too much. So maybe it's a concentration of salt that's, you know, 20 or 2 milligrams per liter or something like that. I don't know. All right, 2 milligrams per liter. Is that clear? So this is, these three things impact the shape of that enzyme. That shape of that enzyme determines whether that enzyme works or not. Are we good with that? Are we, do we have that idea? Is it understandable to you? Is there a confusion to that? Is there something that's like, oh, that doesn't make sense? What is he talking about? I don't get it. Because this is coming on a test. Not just this Friday. I'm going to throw one of these enzyme questions on the test. Not this Friday. Next week. Did I tell you I'm going to move the test to Monday? Yes. The test to Monday. All right? And the test on Monday is going to have at least one of these questions. I can almost, I, I'm going to just say this. I'm going to promise this to you. And hopefully the state doesn't make me a liar. I can, I can promise you that the state is going to put this on your end of course exam. I've seen it in, in five different ways on their practice questions. When somebody tells me five different times that this is a pra here's a practice question, and I see this, here's another practice question, and I see that, and I see it five times, guess what I'm thinking? It's going to be on a test. So you need to understand how enzymes work, that their shape, they depend on shape, and how do you know if the enzyme's working or not if the reaction's going faster? If the, actual, if, the enzyme, if the reaction's not going faster, then the enzyme's not working. That's it. All right. So that should help you understand what this is, what's going on here. By the way, there's this thing called an inorganic catalyst. Enzymes are organic catalyst. A catalyst is what I just described. A catalyst is something that speeds up reactions by bringing things together. That's it. That's what a catalyst does. There are inorganic catalysts like magnesium oxide, dioxide, like you see here, and the manganese dioxide, sorry. Yeah? What's the difference between a catalyst and enzyme? Good question. That's what I'm trying to describe right now. That's a great question. An enzyme is a catalyst. An enzyme is an is a organic catalyst. An uh, inorganic catalyst just means it's not made by living things. It's not carbon-based. Organic catalyst enzymes are, made, are usually proteins. Sometimes they're RNA, but they're made by living things. So we, they're, because they're carbon-based, we call them organic catalysts. Your cars have, you've heard of a catalytic converter? Have you ever heard of that? Never heard of that. There's a catalyst in the catalytic converter. When you burn gasoline, you produce carbon monoxide. If you produce too much carbon monoxide, it could kill people. So you have a catalyst in the catalytic converter when you, there, you know, the exhaust from a car, it runs through the catalytic converter, and what it does is it changes that burning that's happening, that carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide before it leaves the tailpipe. Otherwise, we would have a lot more carbon monoxide, and carbon monoxide is deadly. It'll kill us. So will CO2 in high enough concentration, but CO, CO, carbon monoxide, is much more deadly. So we have catalytic converters in your cars. Those are inorganic. They're just metals or some kind of oxide. Again, what, why is it that you don't have to replace it? Why don't you ever have to replace the catalytic converter unless something goes wrong and it breaks? Why don't you ever have to replace a catalyst? There's a question I could put on a test based on what I've told you. Obviously, something I've told you already. Why, why don't you ever have to replace a catalyst? Did that matchmaker marry the 
the, the husband and the wife? So why the, the, the two people got married, but the matchmaker wasn't married. The matchmaker just keeps marrying more and more people. Why does, I'll ask again, why don't you ever have to replace the catalyst? It's never used. The only thing the catalyst does is help the reaction go on. It doesn't actually get used up. It's not part of the reaction. It's helping the reaction. Does that make sense? It's the same with the enzymes. Enzymes don't get used up. They will eventually get broken down by the body. The body will break them down because you don't want the reactions going on all the time. You just want the reactions whenever you need them. So you turn them on or turn them off. But in general, enzymes aren't used in the reaction. All right, so that is the bottom line, the properties of enzymes. What are the properties of enzymes? Let's go down, the, let's make a bullet list. Will a bullet list help you? Yeah. I think so. Bullet list number one, enzymes are catalysts. They speed up a reaction. Property number two, or bullet point two, uh, enzymes lower the activation energy. That's how they speed it up, right? So these two are connected, right? They speed it up because they lower the activation energy. Bullet point number three, Enzymes are not used up by the reaction. And bullet point four, there is an optimal temperature, salt concentration, and uh, pH for the shape of the enzyme. Question? Will you like read it, the fourth one? There is an optimal temperature, salt concentration, and pH for the shape of the enzyme. And kind of associated with that, the shape of the enzyme determines the function. Okay, so if you, and then lastly, and I'm just going to put the last bullet point, if you change the shape by going outside the optimum. Optimum means the best, right? Temp, pH, or salt range, then the shape changes. Wait, what'd you say? I can't hear you. You're upset about something? Huh? What's happening? No, she told me what I missed, but I was like, oh. So let's go down the list again. Enzymes are catalysts, they speed up a reaction. How do they do it? They speed up a reaction by lowering the activation energy. Enzymes are not used up in the chemical reaction. The matchmaker does not get married. There is an optimal temperature, salt concentration, and pH for the, uh, for the shape of that enzyme. The shape of the enzyme determines the function. If, it, if you change the shape, it's not going to work. 
If you change the shape by going outside the optimum temperature, pH, or salt concentration range, then the shape changes. And again, these two are, these two are connected, right? Change the shape, stop it from working. So let me ask you something, because this is, a, this is the kind of question I've seen on the practice o, uh, OSTs. I, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to ask you a question like this. Here's this graph. Here's this graph. The reaction, that temperature goes up, there's enzymes in there, temperature's going up, reaction, speed of reaction goes up. That makes sense. Here, between 20 and 55, the temperature, the rate of the reaction goes really fast. Then once it reaches a little bit over 55, it crashes, stops, the reaction's not going up any better. Any better. What's happening here? Why isn't it going, the temperature's going up, but the reaction's not going up any faster. Why is it, why is it not going up? What happened? The enzyme was denatured. It's not destroyed. What happens is, remember, that's right, it unraveled. And what's interesting is because the primary structure doesn't change, as long as you don't break the covalent bonds, what's interesting is that if you cool it off again, the enzyme reforms and it starts working again. You can redo it. So you get a fever that's too high. You get a baby that has a really super high fever. Do you know what the first thing they do when you take them to the hospital if it's dangerously high? Good, cold blanket shed. They used to just put them in an ice bucket, in a bath of ice, ice bath. You got to lower that temperature because if you don't lower the temperature, what happens? They, that enzyme's not working. They're not making the building blocks they need. Chaos, entropy will take over. They will start breaking down. You don't want the baby to break down, do you? So you have to give it its ability to build up itself up to keep battling the, the things it has to battle, to do all the things he needs to do or she needs to do. So you lower the temperature as fast as you can. Yes, today we have cold blankets. We have these, like, basically radiators that we can surround you with, and they cool you off very quickly. In fact, they even have uh, intravenous, intravenous machines. They'll suck your blood out, cool it off, and put it back into you cooler. So they'll cool you in from the inside out. That's how many different ways we have to cool you. Because it's important that we cool you down if you get too high. The enzymes will stop working. If the enzymes don't work for long enough, you're done. All right. That's going to be important. So here's another enzyme action. Here's an example of the temporary bonding. Hopefully you're reading these things and you're really getting low. It's called the lock and key theory, right, of the active site. So here's one. One of the substrates, we call them substrates or reactants. Here's another one. They bond temporarily to the various places in the enzyme. Do you see that? They come, the enzyme brings them together. And what happens is they bond. And once they bond, it releases them. You see the bond's formed. It's gone. And it's ready to pick up another one. And it continuously happens all the time. Why does that one have three? Say that again. Why does that one have three? Uh, each of these is a different is a different uh, example of regulation. So it's actually more complicated than what I get into, but I might as well, go, since it's on, this, it's on your coloring book, we might as well go ahead and describe it. So you have an enzyme and a substrate, forms a temporary enzyme substrate, and then in the end you have the enzyme again, not changed, right, and some product. That's how the enzymes work. The substrate could be one substrate, could be two substrates, could be more than two. But the enzyme is going to bring them all together or split them apart, and you're going to end up with some kind of product, something different than when you started with, and you're going to end up with the enzyme that you started with. Is that clear? The enzyme is not changed. That's one of the qualities of enzymes. They reduce the activation energy, they bring things together, they make more products, they make things happen faster. Because you require less energy, they happen faster. But... They themselves are, don't, are not involved in the reaction. They go back and pick up another substrate and it starts over and over and over again. That's the process. So there's, there's, there's kind of two theories uh, that are going on. we got lock and key. In other words, this shape has to fit this shape. This shape has to fit this shape like a lock and a key. 
And if they fit, they, they move, they bond, and life goes on. Another one is that, they, that the enzyme could be sitting there, and, and as they come in, the enzyme forms around the, the substrates. That is also the, the idea. I'm going to tell you to know this one. This is the one I'm going to test you on, okay? You need to know this one. Lock and key. That's the one you're going to see on your end of course exam. That's the one that is often tested. Induced fit is, it, all this is, uh, are legitimate theories, legitimate ways of, of looking at things, but let's just go ahead and, and worry about lock and key theory of how enzymes work, okay? If you want to focus on what's going to be on your final, focus on what's going to be on your test. So we don't actually know like the exact way to do it? We don't see these things. We test them. And lock and key is the one that you're going to get tested on. But none of this stuff, we don't, do you realize, remember that original lab we did early on in, the, in August where we had the bag, the, that paper bag, yeah. and you guys are trying to figure out, I told you, what's the one thing you, you, we never do in science? We can't ever know what's actually in the bag. We just can't. We don't see inside the bag. We can't open the bag and look inside. We don't know. What we know, we've taken pictures of the enzymes with electron microscopes, we've stopped them, we've looked at them, we've mapped them. We know a lot, but we don't know exactly what's going on when this happens. Also, we not nobody really knows if this is a way it always happens, or is it happened most of the time this way, or is it you know, there's a lot of stuff that's just unknown. All right, so there's all kinds of inhibitors, all ways we slow things down. I wish we had time to discuss these. Uh, allosteric regulation is really interesting, very important for uh, cellular respiration in AP biology. I'm going to tell you this. The rest of this stuff, you can read it if you're advanced and you really want to look into this and you're interested in it, that's fine, go ahead and read it. And it's not going to be on the test, all right? There are positive regulation, so things make things go faster. There's inhibitors that make things go slower. There's allosteric inhibitors. In other words, they bind to a different part. This thing binds to this part of the enzyme that inhibits the enzyme from working even when they bond. There's non-competitive inhibition. There's competitive inhibition. In other words, what if instead of the, the actual uh, reactants, something that looks like that reactant binds to it but doesn't actually react with anything, so it, nothing happens? And the enzyme bonds and it temporarily bonds and then it's stuck. It's a fake, it's a decoy. All right? So there's all kinds of things that can happen here. You can read it if you'd like. You're not going to get tested on it. It's not going to be on your end of course exam. So that's the limit. The limit of this course, where we're going to stop is here, this lock and key method. You need to know that an enzyme fits into the substrates, brings them together, reduces the activation energy, is not involved in the chemical reaction itself, and produces a product. That's it. Of the other stuff, it's interesting, it's important, but it's beyond the scope of this course. All right? Can you repeat what you just said? Well, it's kind of, I just, I just summarized what I said earlier, which is what you need to know is that the enzyme bonds to the substrate, and this is the equation right here. This is what you need to know. The enzyme bonds to the substrate, forms an enzyme substrate con uh, uh, enzyme substrate complex. And then in the end, you have the enzyme and some new product, something different. The enzyme goes back and picks up more substrate. The same substrate, based on the shape, based on the shape of the substrate. Lock and key method. The shape of the substrate fits the enzyme. Are we good? That's what you need to know. The rest of this stuff, if you want to read on it, you can. All right, let's move on. So metabolic pathways, we have glycolysis, and you should have read this already, and I kind of, tomorrow, I want to start going over your study guide, and I'm thinking I'm going to move the test to next week and reduce what's on the final because I think it's we're pushing it. I don't think we've gone over this enough. I can tell by your questions, by your responses on your bell work that you really need a little more time to go over this. I do, we, you have to listen to me. We cannot go through more 
We cannot spend any more, that much more time on this. So you need to read. You need to process this information. You need to put it on index cards. You need to work and study here. So you need to get this stuff together. Are you hearing me? All right. Let's, let's be clear. What you need to know for the exams in this class and on your ended course exam is not the structures of anything. You need to know the summaries, which I kind of want to just skip on to your study guide, because your study guide does a great job at giving you what you need to know for your tests. So I almost want to go, go right to the study guide, but let's finish this coloring book first. What you need to know for the test, and you guys can read and do the coloring, but let me see. Let me see how much. So the only thing you need to know for your exam, it's, it's really just pretty straightforward. You have sugar in the form of glucose. This is what? Cellular respiration. <coughs> what you need to know is that glucose goes into the cell. And let's, let's draw a cell. And it, by the way, it's in the this in animal cell or plant cell. I don't care which. It's the same thing's going to happen. In the cytoplasm, in the cytoplasm. So you have to know where it happens in the cytoplasm. Where is the cytoplasm? Those of you that have done your homework, who have studied it, did your test, they want to. It's the area here, right? Inside the cell, inside the membrane. There's an endoskeleton in here, right? That gives it shape. Okay. So you have glucose in here, and I don't, you don't need to know all the different enzymes and all the different changes. You, you don't need to know that for this course. You take glucose. You run it through a bunch of different reactions using different enzymes, reducing the activation energy. You add, you use up two eight, you use up some ATP. I'm not, I'm not even so, I'm not even worried about you knowing exactly how many ATP. It's, you use up, you use some ATP. Isn't it like two? Yes, it is two. That's right. You use up two ATP. All right. And then you produce an intermediate, and you end up making, now there's six, glucose has six carbons, right? You make two pyruvates. I don't even know why I put it. <coughs> and you make... Two, eight, two ATPs each on both sides of these. So how many total? Four. Four ATPs total. So it's two net ATPs. But I don't, you don't, it's not that important. You do make some NADH. What, are NAD, what do you think NADH and FADH2, what do those things do? Carry electrons. Carry electrons, that's right. That's right, good. And they're going to take those electrons where? So electron, electron transport chain, ETC. It really is key that you, you get to, you have that idea in your head. So you have your electron transport chain. You have the two pyruvates. Now here's here's something interesting. This is all happening in the cytoplasm. From here, where are we going to go? Right, there's all kinds of coenzymes and enzymes necessary, but you got your two pyruvates. What needs to happen is this. Say what now? What'd you say? Oh, uh, Antonio asked me what ETC stands for. Oh, electron transport chain, yeah. These pyruvates, by the way, where is the electron transport chain? In the, in the, in the Not in the cytoplasm. In the mitochondria, in the matrix. Usually it's drawn like this. Looks like a pumpernickel loaf or something, right? 
a bunch of membranes inside another membrane, double membrane systems. So the ETC is the ETC is actually inside the mitochondria. So all the electron carriers that are made here in the in the cytoplasm go into the ETC that's in happening in the mitochondria. Is that clear? All right. But you have this pyruvate. There's a lot of energy. These are three carbons each. Does it make sense that one six carbon is made into two three carbons? And mathematically, that makes sense, right? Three plus three equals six. So now we got these three carbon pyruvates. There's still a lot of energy in this. If, now there's a, there's a, if, there's a, this, two possibilities can happen. One, if there is oxygen gas, if you're breathing. When do you not have oxygen gas? When you're dead, but that's not good. When do you not, when do you, when, when you're, while you're alive, when do you not have enough, uh, when you what? Underwater. Underwater, when you're holding your breath. Do you die automatically when you go underwater? No. So when you're holding your breath, you don't die right away. So something must be able to give you some ATP, right? You can't do it for long, but you can do it for a while, right? A couple minutes, some people three minutes, whatever. Yeah, yeah I, I, I've heard. I don't know if that's true, but... I think it's 22, I think. Ooh, I don't, I've never heard that. I heard the longest was 22. I watched the video of the longest. And the record books, I'd have to. He said a secret, and he said he thinks about French fries. I would think someone's cheating on that. But anyways, uh, the bottom line is that you can hold it. You can live without oxygen for a, mi for a few minutes. What's another time you, you're, you're running low on oxygen, not out of oxygen completely? Yeah. Huh? Hopefully not when you sleep. I do because I have sleep apnea, but some people, uh, most of us don't when we sleep. Yeah. When you use energy. When you use energy, what, where, where is it that you, come on, you all know this. Stuff. Exercise, when you're running, long distance. Run a marathon. See if you don't feel like you're running out of oxygen. I mean, all of you run out of breath, haven't you? When you're running out of breath, when you're, <sighs> that's you running out of oxygen. Isn't it making it it, it makes it easier to breathe, but you still need this. You're not getting enough to all your cells. Remember, every one of your cells in your whole body need oxygen. And some of your when you're when you're breathing heavy, it's because some of your cells need more oxygen. So your heart has to pump faster. You have to breathe heavier. You have to breathe deeper and or faster, whatever. You got to get more oxygen. That's immediate, nece immediately necessary. But your body's able to handle not being without or being low, and the way your body does it is it does this thing called fermentation. You've read about it, I hope? Yeah. In the chapter, yeah. I'm glad. I can't tell you how happy I am that some people are reading. So, fermentation. Fermentation is... Three C, three carbons. So what's interesting is that fermentation is what we do when there is no oxygen. And just really quickly, fermentation is without oxygen. It produces a little bit of ATP. And there's one more thing you have to know about fermentation is there's two kinds, two kinds of fermentation. There's alcohol fermentation. And lactic acid, very good. Humans and other mammals do lactic acid fermentation. Yeast and bacteria do alcohol fermentation. When you want to make wine or beer, right, or whatever, you're going to use yeast, which is like baker's yeast, I know, in a way. But actually, they're, they're not. They're, they're a different kind. But anyways, you use, you use yeast to make carbon dioxide, because they produce carbon dioxide and alcohol. All right? And that's what makes your bread rise. Why don't you get drunk? Is there any alcohol in, in bread? 
Doesn't it evaporate? It evaporates. It gets burned off in the oven. There's a little bit, but not enough to, to get you drunk. Uh, there's a there's a drink in, in, in Puerto Rican culture called in Hispanic culture called and you'll see it in the Goya aisle in your th in your in Goya. your it's called Malta very very thick sweet sweet drink it's like it's called Malta because you use malt and malt is the same thing used to make beer this is very little alcohol because they don't add yeast but there could be a little fermentation so. Tomorrow, we're going to go and we'll discuss what happens with oxygen. All right. So for say the respiration, look how little you really need to know. Please compare this to your, your diagrams in your coloring book. It's very, very detailed, right? There's a lot to it. We'll go into a lot of it tomorrow. And we'll try to focus on the study guide tomorrow. Okay? You have to know what happened. What's produced? Where is it produced? What's used? Where does this stuff go? Where does pyruvate go? To the mitochondria and to the TCA, right? The tricarboxylic acid cycle, the Krebs cycle. You know, that kind of stuff is all you really need to know. How it processes, where it happens, what's doing it. But it, I think it's important that you get an idea of, of the concepts. That's why I have you color it all in. Okay. Let's go again. I'm this time recording it. I'm going to say again, this is what we're about to do here. This is an assignment. It's going to be a review for the stuff that you've done over Thanksgiving break. We covered it in class for the most part, but we're going to make sure we cover it and understand it. Your exam will be on Thursday or Friday, depending on our schedule this week. You all, you all have NWA, and I want to make sure that that gets done before. Uh, I don't want that interrupting your exams. Your test, this chapter test, will be done this week, however, either Thursday or Friday. Saturday school is happening this Saturday. If you need help with something, you can come in. Uh, retake some tests or quizzes are available upon request. I know you requested it. We can discuss it during advisory. Are we clear? All right. So let's go through this together then. Here is a coloring book that you're gonna that you're gonna get copies of. It's printing now. You're gonna use you're gonna follow the directions. On one side of the page, you'll see there's a lot of reading, and if you've done your reading, you should understand what we're what we're all what this is all about. Uh, NADP. Everybody recognizes NADP, all right? That's the electron carrier in photosynthesis. ATP is the energy currency of the cell. The Calvin cycle, also known as the Calvin-Benson cycle, these are the two guys that discovered it. Uh, really, it should be known as the Calvin-Benson cycle. Those are two guys that discovered it, or worked it out, I should say. It talks about that another word for these reactions that occur here are thermochemical reactions, but you don't have to know those. I don't, I've never seen them on a standardized exam described that way. Uh, you might want to know them as that, but the bottom line is that they are thermal chemical reactions. They chem they're, they're called the Calvin cycle. You do not you do not need to know all the intermediates, right? Right? Do you remember which ones you have to know for this exam? What are the ones you have to know for the Calvin cycle? Does anybody know? Remember the enzyme that you have to know for the Rubisco is correct. So when we're looking at here, uh, this is this is where carbon dioxide is what? Fixed. This fixed. This is where you take the carbon. This is where the plants take the carbon dioxide out of the air to make what? Carbohydrates. Is perfect. That's exactly right. And this actually goes in a lot more detail than you need. Those of you that are interested in being physicians and love biology, et cetera, try to read it. But are, am I going to test you on it? All right. So I'll give you extra credit if you can describe this. I'll put an extra credit question on the exam, ask you to describe some of the details, to pick a favorite molecule, the Calvin cycle, and describe it. Whatever you like. Uh, so this is extra. However, there's some color coding uh, that you have to do. And let's take a look at what we're talking about here. Even though you don't have to know all the intermediates, 
it would be nice for you to have an appreciation of what's going on here. So Rubisco is what's taking the uh, NADH, uh, the uh, S, uh, sorry, the CO2 out of the air, and you're producing. What are you producing? Carbohydrates. The carbons that are that are collected by Rubisco and the Calvin cycle can be used. By the way, that three carbon sugar can be used in the formation of amino acids, lipids, nucleic acids, and other molecules that they need. These are the building blocks. This is how life gets its matter. The stuff that you are made of. This is what we do. We use carbohydrates and we change them into whatever we need to. We need amino acids. There's one amino acid we cannot make. We can make all the rest of them. But we need nitrogen. We can't take nitrogen out of the soil. We can't take nitrogen as a living being. We can't eat dirt and turn it into protein. We can't breathe in the nitrogen in the air and turn it into protein, right? We can't make a DNA out of them. We have to have a source of these basic building blocks so that we can build ourselves. We are heterotrophs. Is that understood? Yes or no? That means we have to eat. We have to take those building blocks in. We have to break them down and then build ourselves up. We call that metabolism. We, that's the only thing we can do. Plants can do this. Plants can take the carbon and make these building blocks. All right. So here again, we're using ATP. Where did this ATP come from? This is what we're using. Where did ATP come from? Photosystems 1 and 2. That's right, the photoreactions. Here's some more ATP coming from the, the photochemical reactions. Here's CO2 coming in from the atmosphere. Right? Um, and of course, this is what's coming out. Here's NADPH. Where did NADPH come from? The photosystems is correct. Okay, so as long as you understand that, you'd be good. Go ahead and look at it. Take a look at the phosphate groups. Do you all see that? Do you see a phosphate here? There's a, the P, the phosphorus, the four oxygens. There's phosphate. There's two phosphates here, right? That's why you need this ATP. What did it do? It gave a what? The phosphate. The phosphate. There's three phosphates. That's why it's called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Are we good? All right.